Knock. Hi. Hello and welcome to Knock Knock High. We are the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken. I'm Lady Glockenflecken. We got an exciting show today. So uh, we were talking. We were talking with Dr. Adam Goodkoff, uh, who is an emergency medicine resident, That's and right. it was really fun talking with and uh, uh, someone in residency, which That's we haven't right. done yet. It's, I I still remember my residency. Uh, my time in residency. There's a lot of um, fun and uh, very challenging and sometimes very sad and uh, embarrassing moments. That's right. It's That's, been a very it's, intense time of life. It's very intense, <laughs> a wide range of emotions that you deal with. And uh, and so it was awesome to hear Dr. Goodkoff's perspective, not only on residency and medicine, but also social media, because he's got a big social media following as well. That's right. Um, and so we'll get into that in a second. But first, this month, April, you know what April is? What is it? Tell it's, me. It's National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. Oh, okay. It is the time to feel your testicles. This is really, there's, it's always a good time to be familiar with your testicles, uh, but especially this month. Uh, and, um, and I say this, I know I'm an ophthalmologist. Which is uh, you wouldn't think that I'd be that interested in testicles, because uh, ophthalmologist I I specialize in a totally different type of ball, but I did have testicular cancer, and so this is a topic that's very important to me. Yes, and, and me and as you well. as someone who went through all that as well. Right, because you had it not once but twice. That's right. Yep. So and you caught it yourself both times. So maybe give I the did. the listeners and watchers here some advice on what to look for. I am. Yeah, I am. I'm so good at finding my own testicular cancer. It's <laughs> it's really a, a secret talent of mine. Party uh, trick. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> ooh, there's got to be a lot of alcohol at that party. Um. All right. So. Feeling your testicles, uh, you know, they should be kind of egg shaped, a little oblong, not, you shouldn't have any, uh, uh, like hard nodules or like bumps that weren't there before. Um, and, and if you do notice something unusual, definitely go and get it checked out. Testicular cancer, if you catch it early enough, it is eminently treatable. It is very, very treatable. And so uh, uh, for me, I just, I had a couple surgeries. I no longer have any testicles, uh, which is, yeah, minor detail. to be honest, totally fine. Uh, t- I, I really feel like testicles are a bit overrated, um, but uh, they do s- serve some important purposes. But <laughs> so, so, you know, be familiar with your testicles. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. You know? So, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't, I guess it, it's good that we get a whole month of, of talking about testicular cancer. So. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, uh, it's a long, it's a long, long it's, time. To it's talk a about lot balls. of testicle talk, but yeah, but it's important, like you said, because it is so treatable if you catch it early, which you don't want is it spreading to other yeah. things because you waited too long. So and when I, when I found mine, I went in, I got, uh, I got an ultrasound and like, it was like the same day I had my diagnosis. It's like, it's that easy. Uh, and, and then I had surgery like two days later. So, um, uh, which is a tough surgery cause they go right in this, in the inguinal canal and mm. you can't, I think I've talked about this before, but you can't use your ab muscles very well. Yeah. So I kind of like was turtled, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, had mm-hmm. to like roll to get up kind right. of thing. I don't know. You you're were just, taking care You're not going to find a lot of sympathy from someone who's had two children. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Uh, Okay, I could see it in your eyes. Yes, <laughs> that's true. And I'm doing just fine now. Just a little testosterone, you know, every so often, and I'm good to go. Um, so anyway, Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, and so should we get, I mean, that's that's probably enough testicle talk. I think we're good. I don't think we talked about testicles with Dr. I Kuka. don't think so. We talked about we talked other about... very sensitive parts yeah. of the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I'm surprised no they didn't talk. factor in. That's right. All right, let's get to our guest, Dr. Adam Goodkoff, uh, emergency medicine resident and social media personality. He can be found at See the Med Life on Instagram, TikTok, uh, at the Med Life on YouTube. Uh, he's got over 2 million followers across social media. Yeah, so, he's doing some yeah, good stuff doing... educating people about their health. Yeah, great, great educational uh, content, interesting content. And so it's uh, great uh, talking to him. So let's get to Dr. Adam Goodkoff. <laughs> All right, we got Dr. Adam Goodkoff with us, uh, also known on social media as um, uh, at See the Med Life. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, we we actually you might be one of the the first, if not the first, uh, 
resident guests that we've had. And so uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this because you have a, a little bit probably more of a unique path in residency than a lot of us that have been in practice for a while because you started residency when exactly? Uh, it's been, I'm coming up on the end of my third year, so I'm about to graduate. So it was uh, 20, oh gosh, 2020, I guess, um, when I started. Yeah, there was kind of like wow. a thing that was going on. Yeah, a little bit of uh, so it seems like a good time to start a residency. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right? Because so you must have been, whenever the pandemic hit, you were done with like, you, you, you knew where you were going for residency at the time, right? You were yeah, done so with... I, I was actually, um, I was matched and everything already, and I had gone to Japan and Thailand, and so late. Like, when I look back, it's, it's pretty crazy, but I was there, like, if you remember that cruise ship that was pulling up in Japan, I was eating ramen in a bar in Japan, not understanding Japanese, thinking, why are there all those ambulances at the cruise ship? Um so oh my God. yeah, it, it was it was a trip. Obviously, we had no idea what was coming, but you know, it was like, hey, I'm finishing med school. I want to do this trip. I know, yeah. I don't know, we should probably go home, but this, you know, I've been saving up forever for this, so we just stuck it out, and, right. and we got pretty fortunate that uh, you know we didn't we didn't get into trouble. We were able to get back, but yeah, that's that's the start of residency story. You know, after that, uh, June rolled around and moved to Chicago, and there we are. Yeah, and then and then your was was the first like six months of your really probably the first year of your of your residency just covid because you were in, you're in chicago right yeah. so yeah uh, you know chicago was a little bit different than new york in that i think there was kind of a, a small wave what they thought was a big wave before i came and then that summer you know summer always is better for viruses and things were it's like you said it was very um i hate to call it a diluted experience but it was a like a just a different experience than what emergency medicine should be the typical things weren't there you know we weren't seeing mm. um we weren't seeing asthma exacerbations because people didn't want to come in i remember you know, coming into second year, uh, there was an attending and they said, well, what's the dose of steroids? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I've only ever given Dex. I don't know what's <laughs> like, you know, like we just, yeah. we hadn't done those things. So it was, it was a different, but, but on the flip side, I was an expert at a ventilator as an intern. So, um, yeah. that, that first summer was kind of slower in terms of COVID. And then Chicago's real peak was actually kind of the fall of my intern year. So they had the, that second peak was really um, devastating here and kind of overran the ICUs in a similar fashion to New York. And you spent a, a good amount of your first, your intern year do, on, in other places in the hospital, right? Not just emergency department. How much of it was in the ICU? We or did do, they just tell you, hey, we need you there. Like just stay there for a while. I don't yeah. know. The, you know, the, the nice thing about emergency medicines that were, were pretty deployable or diverse, um, we actually ended up covering a fair amount of ER uh, because it was so busy and the volumes were so high with with critical patients. We did, um, we definitely did ICU. I was probably two two or three months trying to think back of ICU time as an intern. But our service didn't get pulled to cover the ICU because there were so many other. You know, we we have a very large internal medicine program, so a lot of them were just you know pulled off of floors and put into critical care, and they were obviously making ICUs on the floor and um, or versions of that. So, but there was such a high volume of patients coming in still crashing that, you know, we were, we were pretty busy with that in the ER. And how, how was that emotionally? Because, you know, intern year is a hard enough time in, in normal years. So, and you're just fresh out of med school. And I mean, you've seen some things, but it's not like you're a seasoned veteran or something at that point. So what was that like emotionally? Yeah, it's, it like gives you the chills to kind of think back on it because it's one of those things like you were born into that. You didn't know anything right. different. So it's just like, okay, I, I guess this is what it is. And and for background, you know, I was an EMT for five years. I've, I've seen a lot in my life even before doing this. But okay. the problem, in my opinion, or the hard part was not what you saw at work. That's sad. And we've all learned to deal with that. But when you go home, you talk to friends and family, you share a meal, a drink, whatever it is. We were going home and being alone. You know, and I'm yeah. very thankful my first year I lived, uh, now I live alone, but at the time I lived with another resident, good friend of mine from med school actually, and then one of our friends. So we had some camaraderie, but there were a lot of residents that were going home, sitting alone, scared. I remember like getting naked in the, in the hallway and, you know, running to the shower. And so right. you're trying to figure all this stuff out. You don't know anything. You're reading on stuff that there's no literature to even read about. And then you're going home. You can't hang out with your friends. You can't make really good relationships with your residents without trying to feel like you're sneaking around at night, you know, right. at the risk of COVID. You know, you go to a party normally and you can't take a drink from someone else or stand close to someone else, you know? So it, it was, um, I think the, the, Kind of interpersonal aspect was actually a lot harder I and mean, it was obviously devastating what we were seeing but the fact that you didn't have any real way to 
blow off steam. Right. right. That's such a huge part of, of training is yeah. being around your, your co-residents, you know, passing them in the halls and, or just getting together outside and being able to commiserate and, and, and vent. That's like, that's one of the core competencies of residency. I <laughs> yeah, think. right. I think Me- measurable be- outcomes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was, it's funny too, like um, from, from personal relationships in the hospital. Now our program is a, is different because we do rotate through a couple hospitals that we staff, but um, you know, there were people at the end of the year that I, I didn't even recognize them because it was mask mm. wearing was so strict that, you know, you're going through a whole mm. shift with your N95 and goggles on the whole time that when the time came that we took masks off, I'm like, Oh, that's, 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 like. that's not what like. I pictured. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's, it was, uh, God, so it was, it was kind of interesting. Do you yeah. think, was wow. it like pleasant surprises or negative surprises? And you don't have to name any names or anything, but just like, <laughs> what is that like when you've got this group of coworkers? Did you tend to skew, like, I thought you were better looking or, oh, wow, I didn't know that was under there. I, if I'm honest, I think it was it was more of the other like I didn't realize how much someone's smile and mouth made up like identity of the face. You know, you think of yeah. eyes and obviously we're right. looking at eyes all the time. And, you know, it's the same thing. Again, I mean, I really am looking at eyes all the time. Right? But yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> you literally are. I'm glad uh, you said it. Good. Yeah. You know, it's got to be said. But um, but it, it was but yeah, it, lower half is important. Yeah. So it, it was alarming. Jaw structure. All that stuff is lost when you have a mask on. And so, you know, I don't know that it was necessarily I was like, oh, my gosh, it was just more like I had no like my what my brain filled in the details for you right, is so wrong. Like the Mr. Potato about. Head didn't fit. Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> so. I mean, I, you know, I work with uh, with a bunch of staff at our surgery center. And even though I, mean, I haven't seen some of their faces ever. And so when we <laughs> when we get, we get together for like, you know, uh, I think we had our first holiday party like in person uh, this year. And all of a sudden I like wasn't recognizing people that I'd been working with for five years. And yeah. I imagine it's even worse whenever you have even more PPE covering um, yourself. But then, you know, you're at a I don't know if it would be fair or unfair or advantage or disadvantage, but everybody probably knew what your face looked like because of the, you know, extracurricular activities you were involved in. So they all knew what you looked like. Yeah, you had no idea. And that, and that started, you started the, the, the see the med life kind of right at the beginning of your training, right? Well, so I'd actually been on social media for a while before that. So I had an Instagram mm-hmm. presence um, and I was doing social media in med school as well with a bit of a different focus, but you're, you're exactly correct. I mean, Right around the time, I remember opening TikTok in Thailand and being like, 10,000 views. This is wild, you know, and I hadn't posted in forever. And it started to started to grow and grow. And so when I came back, I'm like, I guess I have to figure out some way. I didn't like TikTok. As many of us, I think, like in the beginning, I, just, I didn't like it. I wasn't comfortable. I preferred Instagram. And But there was so much growth. And so, yeah, that's kind of, I, I went all in and doubled down. And that's when the growth started. The growth is crazy, right? That Around that time of year yeah. uh, in 2020. Uh, same yeah. thing for me. Like that's when I, I was in, in lockdown and we weren't able to see any patients in our clinics. And, and so I started making videos and it was just shocking and really not just TikTok, but all over social media, just that's all people were doing. Right. Netflix and social media was everyone's like, lives. That's, <laughs> that, Cause that's the only way you could connect with people at that point. And it's so true. the, yeah. the amount of, of just traffic and, and what were you, what were you doing on social media? Like around, cause I, First of all, I can't even believe that you were able to like post content consistently during residency. Yeah. Yeah. During a pandemic. Like that's, what? that's there was a little bit going on there. So, yeah. Uh, right. You know how 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 did you make, how keep do you up do with that? all that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, we can get into it a little bit, and that was you know, and we may talk about it later on. It's some of the speculation and the the difficulties that I faced personally as a resident. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, to answer your question, I started as I, I was a medical student. And I felt like I had did a teaching fellowship as well. I've always been a big, you know, teacher instructor, and um, I really take passion in that. And so I was like, I have all this stuff that I want to share with more than just the one class that I'm teaching. And so I started sharing that on social media. That grew, and then you know, exactly like you said, during the pandemic, there was just this void, a vacuum of knowledge gap of everyone in the public wanting some kind of reputable information. And I don't think you necessarily needed a degree to provide accurate health information. Um, and of course, I mean, at the time I did have, uh, you know, completed medical school, but it, it, you know, we still had knowledge and you could go and look and do knowledge translation for the general public. And so that's what I was there for. Um, the way that I did this during residency, the beginning was, it was very, very hard, um, cause I was doing yeah. it all myself. And what I tried to do is structure it around both popular content, but also things that may be helpful to me. So I could almost like study 
and oh, prepare nice. for a video at that's the same time. Smart. Yeah. Uh, um, that's good. And and ultimately though, it got to a point where I was just so burnt out. You know, I couldn't, you, you know, the work, it doesn't seem like a lot of work, but the work that goes into maintaining, you know, a social media, it's, it's a lot. And so, oh yeah. Uh, one of my best friends from growing up, uh, he was also sitting around at home and not doing much. So I said, Hey, I'll give you a percentage of whatever we get. It's not much now, you know, at the time it was, it was almost nothing. Yeah. And I, I really thank him for taking a leap of faith. And, you know, so he took over actually executing because the problem was I was going to work at all these hours and I couldn't actually post the content. So I couldn't, you know, I'm not right. gonna step away and just go, you know, make a video or post a video. So I was having to record them at home and then try to get them up during those good hours. And so that's what Josh had taken over, you know, getting the content uh -huh. up, managing the comments and things. And of course I'd interact when I could, um, but I would, I would try to batch film, you know, I would get home and I'd film three videos and then pass out. And then the next day they would get uploaded one at a time, you know? So. Right. I think there's a good lesson there and kudos to you for, for doing that because you have to rely on a team. Like I think, I don't, maybe it's just cause I'm married to him. This is how he is, but seems like the medical training system kind of foster. I mean, yes, it's collaborative. There's a team, but you're supposed to know everything and you get quizzed all the time at random times and you get, you know, you feel like you have to be this like independent to a fault. I have to know everything. I have to do everything. I have to, you know, be able to be counted on at all times for anything but um, you need to rely on the people around you in order to get things done. And I think anybody that you look at them and you go, how, there's only 24 hours in a day and they have the same 24 hours in a day that I do. How are they doing all of that? No, they don't have the same 24 hours that you do because they're hiring a team, <laughs> right. right? Or they're yeah. using a team and in some way. Good job recognizing that. That's, yeah. yeah. But you alluded to the, the idea that uh, maybe your, the, your program or people weren't, too keen on on you making content oh, is yeah. that yeah, something you can talk like? because you're still a resident right <laughs> i'm a resident uh, for a few more months so it's a delicate um <laughs> yeah, i, I right. think in a few months you know we don't want to screw anything up here okay? correct, correct so please don't get fired from right. going on glock and fleckens podcast yeah. here so right. yeah. we'll, we'll do a part two now i can i can yeah. share some of the details um kind of sure. like the the uh, declassified version but um it, it it's what you would imagine you know um a young all, all of the stereotypes of what this young, tall doctor that's walking into the hospital for the first time is going to act like are preformed, period. And then you go and watch someone on social media and all of the bad influencer, this, that, that all these labels are slapped on. And so you walk in and you are the most hated person that has ever existed on planet Earth. And, and why is it jealousy? Is it that they don't think you are smart enough to be there? What is it that they're projecting I, I don't, onto you? I don't want to... Uh, assume and get there. myself okay. in any situations but i think that <laughs> some of the you know the feedback verbally that i would get from people in passing is don't you think you should spend more time reading or who who are uh, you to tell someone information you don't know anything you're an intern so yeah. you know that classical hierarchy of knowledge um you know and it was it was a lot of people sitting around waiting for me to make a mistake right everybody mm -hmm. could see everything i was doing it was highly visible so i'm and among my friends there is like you are so worried about everything it's like because one mistake is all mm -hmm. it takes for the bandwagon to turn around and say, see, we told you he shouldn't have been doing this. And it, it really right. wasn't until, and, and I'm, I don't want to um, make it like I'm on bad terms with my program. I, they, I'm on good terms with them and they appreciate what I do, but I mm. think rightfully so, you know, they were concerned. They didn't know me personally. And I came in and I'm making all this content. It's the same questions. You know, how could he possibly be studying if he's doing all of this? And it took really probably a year and a half, two years for them to be like, okay, he's actually a competent physician somehow gets his studying done and, and is, you know, effective right. and kind with his patients. So that was a, something that had to be earned. Um, but it was, there were definitely some large speed bumps that are uh, for a different time. Uh, you yeah. know, yeah. You, you show, you, you show them that, okay, yeah, I, I have this hobby and it's just a very public hobby. Like, and I, I'm always talking to, to, you know, trainees about this, like you gotta, you gotta have the thing like outside of your job that yeah. you, that you still keep doing or that you like to do and yours just happens you know to be very public and exactly. and it's yeah but if they're not judging someone else for oh they go home and they read fiction at night how could they be you know i mean it's all you should yeah. have a hobby or video games or yeah. sports or you know whatever it is yeah. and so uh, like you said you got to blow off steam somehow or you got to express different parts of your of yourself than you can at work exactly I think it's, it's great because we needed, I mean, especially around that time, I think we needed 
you know, competent physician voices on social media. We sure. still do. Like it's, right. it's a really important thing to have because that's where people are. Everyone's on social media in some respect getting information. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's a great you thing. You need there to be accurate stuff out there. And I'm but... glad, I'm glad you didn't get fired. That's, and, and you're, well, it's you're not so, too late, you're so, so close. Just back off. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's take it easy. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, it, to, to that point, um, I think hopefully we're, we're good and, you know, I, I have, yeah. everybody learns and, um, hopefully, you know, mistakes are things that you make one time and learn from. And so, you know, the mistakes that I've made along the way are things that have helped, you know, shape the way that I practice social media, so to speak, outside of my real job. And, um, I, I think that, uh, it's also, you know, when done right can, can be a tremendous opportunity. It's, it's one of those things. It's like a calculated risk, but the amount of people right. that you can help with social media, as you mentioned, well, with, with, you know, reaching educational reach and filling a knowledge gap is, is super rewarding. Um, and it's, it's worth something. It's worth the time. And so interesting. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and, you know, we've, we've talked about your ability to, um, to juggle all these things, you know, pandemic training, you know, your content, uh, the most important question that's been on my mind for the last like 10 minutes, uh, how did you learn the slit lamp exam? That's the most important <laughs> thing that, I mean, I don't know how, how, how are your skills these days? Is so, this... so I, I think, uh, I pride myself on my slit lamp. Uh, I've actually seen sl cell and flare independently. So I'm very proud you have. of that. Yep. Oh, good uh, job. Once, that's... once. But uh, what, uh, hey, that, yeah. that counts. It yeah. counts. So, well done. so uh, we, you know, without divulging too much details, we're at a very, very big eye center here. And so I have befriended the Optho residents in any time, hey. which is often that we're working there. We consult them. They're there all night, unfortunately, for them. Um, anything that's cool, I'm like, hey, just grab me. I I'd love to learn how to do that because uh, eyes are creepy. That's great. And, uh, you know, I want to <laughs> I want to do it now so that later I know what I'm doing. So it's Absolutely. it's tricky. But, um, I love doing that. Whenever I was, you know, I went to Iowa and a very busy level one trauma center. And yeah, I was very frequently grabbing the, the emergency medicine residents and yeah. kind of showing off my, cause I, I, I could only, there's only so much I can show off to an emergency doctor, <laughs> yeah. right? Like right. there, you get, you know, so much <laughs> like you, you do. And so like, and that balance tips the other well, way. Well, when usually. you look at it, like in one respect, it's like, you know, it's these cool eye things, but also like, you know, they're just finished like saving lives. And I'm like, right. Hey, look at this corneal ulcer. Yeah. Right. Isn't this interesting? <laughs> no, I think it's, so, it, it really is fascinating. The relationship that we have with our, with the specialists and, um, I think a good ER physician really respects the amount of knowledge that consultants can bring to the table. Um, and there's, there's so much, you know, I'll look at, especially with eyes, but like I had a, someone yeah. that had like an, a battery acid burn and I'm like, there's no way they're going to lose their eye. You know, I'm sending pictures to the ophthalmologist and I'm like, they're going to say transfer emergently all this. And they're like, looks like great. You did a great job irrigating. We'll see him tomorrow morning. And I'm like, is this a, yep. is this a play? You just don't want to come in or is it really okay? <laughs> like, you know, and I go home and read on it and I'm like, oh, it's actually okay. Like this yeah. is, this guy's probably going to recover here. So there, you know, there's just, there's only so much that we can know and we have to know about a lot of right. things. And so I love having those conversations with, with all the specialties and be like, wow, that's fascinating. I had no idea. So. Yeah. Acids, acids are much uh, better than bases. Bases right. are when we're, those are the, uh, the pants patients as I like to call them. Those, so you tell me about an a basic, uh, you know, like a lie or, a, a, right. you know, sodium hydroxide or something, I'm putting my pants on and I'm coming in to see the patient. So, like um, the acids, uh, just for everyone's reference, it's, it's still, an, it's still something you should see someone yeah, about. We're not recommending pouring acid not, in your it's eyes. It's still a bad thing. It's just not quite as like devastating as like a basic injury. Right, right. Have you, do you feel like you've over the course of your residency, you've hit up all the all the specialties have you have you have they have you gotten all of them into the emergency department at this point? oh yeah 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 we i've even, even had the plastics. dermatologists even uh, the dermatologists I, I had derm actually it was just this year earlier and it's actually going to be presented at a case report in new orleans so not that they came <laughs> into the er but the case itself um <laughs> So Do you guys have like a bingo card of the time yeah, the, the ones should. you're trying to get in? Yeah, <laughs> we should. And then yeah. at the end of residency, right. the one that has the most wins a prize. I'll start it. I'll start it. That's yeah. a good idea. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. You're welcome. And plastics <laughs> is that the other one that's hard to get into? Plastics, yeah. The I've hard... had plastics come in a few times. Yeah. Um, again, these these things are easier to get done at the university center. We work at a couple mm -hmm. sites, so um, it just depends. But yeah, that would be those are probably the two hardest. Getting radiology to appear in the department that's like oh. Happen. It's like happened, coming though. to the what in what situation would they come? Uh, interventional, to? 
Oh, so gotcha, like if they've done gotcha. a procedure that yeah, would yeah. happen to be bleeding profusely at 3 a.m. that you're not able to stop despite a figure of eight stitch or anything like that. Not that now, that's do you, a specific. Because I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, at this point, it's been like five years since I've been in a, in a, like an academic center. Sure. Um, and so I cover a lot of, uh, like four different community hospitals. Do you, do you get out into the community as part of your training? Is that, is that? Yeah. A... So we, we have a really diverse, um, training setup, which is, I think what's really valuable about our program. So we have a hardcore academic site, um, where you just like the joke is if someone comes in with a stub toe, they also happen to have an AKI and their transplanted kidney because their liver is failing. That was transplanted two months prior. So it's just like, yes. nothing is straightforward. Yeah. Um, you know, and then we have kind of a community fast pace hybrid. It, it's not really academic, but it, it has a lot of residency programs in it. And so you get to see what high efficiency is. Um, we have like kind of a, I don't call it like a community trauma center. It's a level one, but it's more like lower acuity level one stuff. And then, you know, we have a true community site that is in, in the South side. You're the, the patients are the incredibly sick there. And it's just super rewarding because, um, you're just seeing mm -hmm. not even bread and butter. I, I don't even know how to describe it. They are so, so sick. And so, uh, very, very high action. And you're, you know, learning about that process of transferring and dealing with consultants that don't come into the hospital or maybe don't have a service there. Is there a, a setting that appeals to you as far as your future career? You know, I personally enjoy that kind of community or community hybrid setting. I think um, yeah, academic is a, a special place, but it's it's probably not a place that fits my personality the most. Um, yeah. And and on the flip side, I think you know, community alone can be tough. Um, they see a lot of patients and have a lot of uh, you know a lot of things put on them as well. So it's a unique challenge in every setting. But I, I kind of like you know, I think the perfect world is maybe that community community hybrid. Um, and that's kind of mm -hmm. where, where I'll be going, um, next year. Now you mentioned the, just the breadth of, of things that you, you know, um, you know about and that you encounter and you have to deal with. Uh, and so the learning opportunities are seemingly endless in emergency medicine, but I, I want to let you get to some of these stories that you brought with us, with you today. Cause we asked you to, you know, we love stories in this podcast, sure. especially from trainees or people in med school residency, cause that's when some of the really interesting learning opportunities happen. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. uh, tell, tell us about some of these experiences you had uh, early on. Again, nothing that will get you fired. <laughs> right, you don't right. want to be responsible for that. <laughs> right. But. One, no, one of my good. favorite ones, and I don't know if it got included on the list, but I'd love to share it. It's it's pretty PG. Um, I was a med student. So I was a fourth year med student doing an away rotation at a very, very well-known, we'll call it like an Ivy League EM program. And so this was a big deal. And it, I'm a DO. So for me to get this rotation was huge. I needed a big letter. That was like my power piece to be able to go wherever I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing this laceration repair on this woman's face and I've done a ton. So of course, you know, med students are very cocky in fourth year. So I'm like, ah, <laughs> Oh yeah, this is going <laughs> to be great. Yeah. So this lady's great. And I'm talking to her as nice old lady. I'm closing up her face. It's like a cut right here. And, uh, and I guess it kind of comes down here. And so I had injected lidocaine or whatever. And we're going, I close the thing up. I'm like, how's it feel? And she's like, it's good. I'm like, can't, she cannot raise the side of her face at all. And I'm like, oh, no. so it's, it's going down into her brow. And, right. And, and I've and, now, and there, there's some tissue and stuff, but again, I'm yeah. like a fourth year. I don't care. I'm just going away, closing this up. I'm like, wow, I did a great job. And I don't know what made me say it, but I'm looking at her and I'm like, can you raise your eyebrows? And the, the other side goes up uh -huh. and the affected side just doesn't move. And I just like oh. instantly mm. defecate in my pants. And I'm like, <laughs> what no did way. I hit? I'm like, what did can, I do? can you smile? And so her face is moving. I'm like, I just ligated her nerve. Like I must have sutured her nerve. And oh, so yeah. I go and I'm like, I just have to be honest and I come clean on this. And I go to the attending and I'm like, I'm really sorry. I don't know what I did, but this woman's eyebrow doesn't move anymore. And he kind of like smiles and gets up. And again, I'm like profusely sweating. <laughs> like this is my one chance. And he goes in <laughs> and uh, looks, has her move, whatever, looks at the sutures. Okay. Comes back out. And he's like, so uh, what happened in there? And I was like, I don't know. I closed it up and I'm going through the whole thing. And he's like, well, what would happen if you instilled a lot of lidocaine around a nerve? And I was like, I would go numb. And he's like, and what's on the inside of the sensory component? And I was like, motor. And he's like, yeah. He just numbed know. up the motor component. And and sure enough, like, you know, oh, he yeah. called her the next day and she was able to move her eyebrow. But I was like, oh my God, I just <laughs> cut this woman's nerve to her face. I'm going to prison, like all, you know, oh, all no. the above. So I just gave a little Botox. That's yeah. all. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that was, that was a, so, uh, a good one. 
So here's oh here's something uh, just real quick about lacerations to the face, forehead, brow. Uh, so, because you know, I have to do a fair number of last. Actually, you know, emergency visit. You guys are really good at the at facial lacerations. When it gets below the brow, that's when it can get tricky, and sometimes the ophthalmologist gets called in. You can't really screw a whole lot up with a laceration of the forehead, right. and if you get into the brow, it's when you get below the brow. Uh, onto the eyelid that's when you can really start because there's an eyeball under there adam oh, yeah. it's yeah. you know so so the with the brow you can put deep sutures in that's fine but you don't want to do that on the eyelid it's right. it's uh, all surface kind of closing the skin so so it's just like a very thin tiny yeah working space for you yeah and versus just, is this more like you know significant structures around right. the eyelid but the brow, they don't tend you know, to like it the brow's fine it's, yeah, it's like suturing just... on top of a balloon paper on top of right. a balloon but if you go uh, through right. the balloon you know yeah, ex- so. ex- exactly well, that's you what we it. call an open globe <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah exactly I've never, fortunately, knock on wood, never seen like an atrogenic open globe from yeah. a, an attempted uh, eyelid repair. <laughs> and so I feel like that that would be actually fairly difficult an to atro- accomplish. Atro, what? Atrogenic, uh, where the, the person fixed it, caused it. Oh. Kind of thing. Gotcha. Fancy word um, to cover up a whoopsie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the whoopsie. Yeah. That's good. All right. Yeah. T- give a, uh, tell us uh, what else. What else you got here? Because you got some good ones. I, yeah, I, ha- I have <laughs> two that come to mind. One is just pure embarrassment, and uh, I own it to this day. So I was on surgery, and I had I had gone to a, like a medical school that focused on rural rotations, and so there were no residents in this hospital. It was me and the attending surgeon. And it's a female surgeon. She was fantastic and she was tough. And so she's like, go mm. around on the patients. Tell me what needs to be done, whatever. So I'm like, great, we have this wound check. So she says, okay, well, you're running the service. So I'll turn the patient and you take a look. And so fine, I've seen some wounds. We do the wound clinic, we roll over and I go, oh my God, that is, the, there is a profound sacral ulcer here. We probably have to take her to surgery or something. And she goes, really? I wasn't expecting to find anything. And she looks, and there's family in the room. There's the nurse, and I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the worst sacral ulcer I've ever seen. You made a call right there. You put your nickel down on sacral ulcer. Oh, yeah. Okay. So she All looks right. over the top, and she goes, "We could talk about it outside." <laughs> okay. Oh no. So we go outside, and she goes, "That, um, that's a rectum. That's a prolapsed rectum." And I was just, <laughs> I was just beat red in the face. Oh, oh man. Oh no. So. And you, were even, a, you were a third year, fourth year? I was year? a third year. Yeah. So third it's, year? It, it's excusable, but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but I just was Still like, embarrassing. I'd never seen one. And I was like, I guess it's in the area I've seen these other wounds. And it was, it was mortifying. So, so was she expecting to see something like that? That was probably wholly unexpected, right? For the, <laughs> yeah. To see yeah no, I, I think, I don't <laughs> think they knew that she had that yeah. condition. And so, you know, to me, it looked like a like just massive fungating wound. But in fact, that was just oh rectal gosh. tissue. The prolapsed rectum. Yeah. Now, which Either is so- way, that doesn't sound great. Well, for it's, the it's something patient. that you, you've probably seen a lot more of uh, since then, <laughs> yeah. I imagine, in emergency yeah. medicine, right? No, it's, and actually, like I said, every, yeah, everything's a learning opportunity. So I, I never miss that again. But uh, and I, I actually, yeah, right? I learned, you know, because as an ophthalmologist, like the only, I only get like learn things outside of my field that I just happen to see on social media and actually yeah. learned how to like reduce a prolapsed rectum. Yep. Do you know what you, can you guess what you do? Do you? Ha- yeah. Mm. Well, do you have to digitally? You'll never guess. You'll no. Yeah, yeah you I don't won't get no, no, you don't do that. Okay. I give you a clue. I give you an easy clue. Okay. okay. I mean, it won't, won't help. But Knowing have... I know nothing about any of this. Well, this we have we have to go to the cafeteria to solve the problem. You need some utensils. Mm, no. no, we've got instruments. Okay. Uh, it's an ingredient. Prolapsed... Oh, reducing what? When you say reduce the rectum, does that mean that you put it back putting in? It back in? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have no You'll have idea. To just tell her. It's uh, it. so if you pour sugar on a rectum, it dehydrates the tissue and actually lets it involute back in. So if you literally pour some sugar, domino on sugar, me, all over yeah. the rectum. Yeah, there you go. Oh well, that's and a that, handy that's, tip that I hope never to have amazing. to use. Man, yeah. I, that's one of those things. Like the first person that did that was they like that is a genius move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want right? to know how they figured that out. Uh, I almost I mean, don't want to know. It's, <laughs> right? it's, it's just like chemistry and biology. I mean, I it's like, it I guess if you think about it 
from that standpoint is a very smart person yeah, yeah. no but i mean it makes a lot of sense it's so like you just sprinkle basic. a little sugar on it yeah well a lot of do sugar. you have to like put it in the oven at 350 or what how does that work <laughs> 15 minutes usually yeah 15, 15 minutes, minutes will do it <laughs> all right you got one more tell us tell us the other one because this I is also a pretty good one yeah so this one is this is a residency story there was for the record uh everyone's de-identified and there's no poor adverse outcomes but um so again this is during covid we're putting in lots of lines in the icu and uh i had thought for a little that i wanted to do anesthesia so i came into residency with like again rural no residents, crazy numbers. I had done maybe like 50 intubations, 25 central lines, all as a med student. Um, so I was quite competent putting in lines on my own. And so the seniors in the ICU were busy with all these crashing patients. So if there was a line, they're like, you can go do it. You know, we, we feel comfortable and you get us if there's a problem. So I'd done a bunch of lines and one of the anesthesia second year residents that was rotating was like, hey, I haven't gotten to put in a line yet. Would you mind showing me how to do it? And I said, fine. So I take her, we go to the room and again, intern, learning the ropes didn't really check the chart because the senior told me go put the line in so i said okay great so it turns out first of all there was a dialysis line and i've actually at the time had only maybe done like two or three dialysis lines and for the record yeah. i don't have anything to even show the the caliber but um like a central line this, this is it's decent big. i don't know if it'll come through <laughs> on camera but a central line is small it's maybe like this this thick so it fits between your hands and a a, a dialysis line is bigger than a pen i mean it's it's pretty impressive. It's wide diameter. Yeah. Oh yeah. Almost like a guarding hose. And so Ugh. a small hose. So, mm -hmm. you know, I get the kit out and we get ready and she's doing the procedure and I'm watching or supervising as an intern, which is again, Yikes. you know, different times. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. um, and of course the, the attending is supervising as well from outside the room. Um, right. but, right uh, there. so, right there. so we're, yeah, so we're present we're, um, for the most important parts of the procedure. Key, okay. key, key port. Yes. Key portions of the procedure. Um, so, you know, she finds the vessel under ultrasound. I say, it's great. And, you know, I'm, it's different when your hand's not on the probe. You know, for me, they work in, in tandem at this point. So I know exactly where I am on the screen. So I'm watching her. And I'm like, I think you're, I think you're good. That looks good. So she detaches the needle. It's bleeding a little more than normal, but I'm like, ah, nothing, nothing crazy. So now with a hemodialysis line, there's two dilators. So we put the first dilator in. And normally after this, of course, you, so the dilator um, is is this like piece of plastic that's like um, uh, almost like a reverse cone. So you're like spreading the skin and the vessel apart. So we put the first dilator in. We take that out. It usually bleeds. So we take that out. It's like more bleeding than normal to the point that I, I go, I really hope like that, that can't be the artery because this is a big vascular emergency if you dilate an artery. So I stop and we look with the ultrasound. The wire, the, well, there's a guide wire in at this point. The guide wire is definitely in the vein. So I feel good. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, why don't you put the next one in? She puts the big dilator in and takes this thing out and does not know to put pressure on. And there is like a fountain that just comes back out, like oh, no. worse than an artery, just a constant stream spitting fountain. And I'm like, same feeling actually when the woman's yeah. face became paralyzed. I was like, <laughs> I've done it again, just a year later, and here we are. <laughs> and, um, and Careers so flashing I, before your eyes. There right. you go. It's like, yep, that's so much for residency. So I'm, I'm like, put your hand there, push, whatever. So we go and um, uh, I'm, I'm like thinking through, like, what can I do? What can I do? The, the senior, of course, is there, but also doesn't know what to do. And so I'm like, well, the best thing we do is fill the open hole. So we end up just going through, completing the line, sticking the dialysis line in and suturing it down. And actually the bleeding stopped. And afterward, I'm sitting around. I'm like, man, I've done these. I've done a million central lines and I've done, a, you know, enough HD lines to feel comfortable. Like, what did I miss? I'm going through the chart, and it turns out the patient was like a stroke patient and had gotten TPA, and so probably TPA. shouldn't have been getting a line in TPA that amount of time. Is the clot busting medication? So you thin oh, the blood, no. like it's like yeah. it's like water, yeah. right? Yeah. So probably not the best time to do a procedure. And again, you know, Whoopsie. thankfully <laughs> no no adverse outcome, and there's Everything a lot of a lot okay. of learning that happens in residency. But that was. Yep. Um, that was eye-opening, and I can tell you, I always chart review before I do any procedures now. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> learning from the mistakes, right? That's right. Absolutely. And everything, everything ended up okay. Everything and, was okay, but and, it definitely you know, is. There's, you know, there are a lot of, I, I've got so many stories. I mean, obviously, I didn't put any, I, I've never done any hemodialysis lines, if you can imagine that as an ophthalmologist. Um, but, uh, certainly have plenty of mistakes I've made and the key is figuring out what led to that mistake. Right. And then not ever doing that again. Right. right. So of course, correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah.
I, I think the thing that a lot of people forget, and you hear this all the time, like, I'm going to sue, I'm going to sue, like medicine is a practice and it is something that requires a, a tremendous, tremendous amount of skill, but also refinement and continual mm -hmm. improvement. And so you're going to make mistakes. There are going to be things that you don't know and things are not going to work the way that they're supposed to. But it's about, you know, just like you said, how do you localize what that problem was, fix it and make sure that it never happens again and that you have a system in place to avoid those things. So I think exactly. every time there's a, an adverse event, it's like, what could I do differently to avoid even getting here? Very well said. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll come back with Dr. Adam Goodkoff. Big thank you to all our wonderful listeners out there. Spread the love. Share this podcast with everybody. Leave a rating and a review. You can be honest. All right, we, we're used to constructive criticism. That's fine. Tell us what you think. All right, we want to hear your thoughts. Later today, we're going to share some stories, some of your own medical stories. Uh, you can share yours with us. Knock, knock, hi at human-content.com. Also, check out our Patreon. Uh, come hang out with other members of this community. You get early episode access. Uh, bonus episodes. Uh, we have this whole other monthly show where we, Kristen and I, react to medical TV shows and movies. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we're posting content on there, and uh, it's it's great. So check us out on Patreon. Now, let's get back to Dr. Adam Goodkoff. All right, we are back with Dr. Adam Goodkoff at See the Med Life on social media. And uh, we are going to do something I, I just came up with last night. Um, I was thinking about my experience in emergency medicine because I did two rotations in intern year in wow. uh, the emergency department. And it's there's uh, probably the most vivid memories I have are just like seeing things on the status board. Like I just, the, the status board is such a big part of that experience because for me, it was somewhat traumatizing, the status board. Yeah. Uh, and so, first of all, can you just give us a quick, like, just tell people what the ED status board is? Yeah. So, so status board, tracking shell, every system kind of has a different name for it. But it's basically, you know, all of the patients that are checked in, in the waiting room, all of the patients that are in rooms. And then it's, you know, depending on what you have set up, their acuity. So how, how sick they're projected to be, what their vitals are, what their chief complaint is, which is usually just a one worder that is oftentimes inaccurate. Um, and so, you know, and then their wait time. And so a lot of things that create anxiety, you know, they've been here for 10 hours with chest pain. It's like, oh man, are they still alive out there? Right. Um, you know, so or wanna... 75 in the waiting room. Yeah. There's it's a lot so of just a, a, a giant summary of right. everything happening in the, in the emergency department. And so, uh, I want to focus on that chief complaint because that was, that's what I remember the most, uh, uh, even with residency. Cause I remember going in and seeing eye pain like five times, on or eye problem is what it was. It, was, it wasn't even differentiated <laughs> right. by like actual thing. It was like eye problem. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was uh, I'm going to give you uh, two. So look, this is the situation. All right. You're sitting there with like your, we'll say your co-resident and two patients pop up at the same time. And your co-resident turns to you and said, you get to choose. What do you want to do? All right. So I'm going like to give this. you two chief complaints and you're going to tell me which one you choose, I love all right, it. and why. All right, so we're going to start chest pain versus shortness of breath. Chest pain, all day. Oh, yeah? Really? Chest, chest pain's easy. Chest pain, so there are certain things where you can, once you've done your, you know, a thorough history, you can kind of turn your brain off. Chest pain is one of them. If you've made sure it's not some of the other things, there's a very clear pathway in the United States that we work up chest pain, that we decide who comes in and who does not to the hospital. So it is a very it's easy to boost your numbers. And if you're trying to, a lot of the second years want to see a lot of patients, they'll pick up things like, well, oh. I don't want to spoil them, but they'll pick, that's one thing that they'll try and pick up because it's very, get your troponins, get your labs, make a decision. It's very quick. So you got the algorithm there, you know, yeah. you know exactly what to do. Lug and chug. Exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. So there you go. Uh, tough, tough uh, first round for shortness of breath. Sorry about that. Uh, Cause that could be a lot of things, right? Uh, I guess. Yeah. And then the you, then you the, the real reason we don't, I don't want to pick shortness of breath is you go down the dimer route into PEs and then you're like in the weeds and then maybe you need oh. a scan. Now you're really adding time. So that's gotcha. a tough one. Okay. All right. Back pain versus abdominal pain. <laughs> that's rough. Yeah. With just, with just those words, I'd probably that's do back pain. I've, I've been come, yeah. I've become much more comfortable with back pain. Um, okay. it's one of those complaints that you initially like as an intern hate because you're like, I can't give, I can't make them feel better and they want narcotics. And the truth is they don't, people just want to feel better. They can't move their back is right. spasming. And so when you find out what it is that you, you know, give people to fix that and they are 
so thankful. Um, it, it can be really rewarding. So, and, and then educate, it's a big chance for education because everyone's like, I need an MRI. And I'm like, no, you don't not right now. You don't, you know, there are indications for an MRI, but, um, you know, helping someone understand what those red flags are can also be rewarding. Mm-hmm. So, um, is, is, a, is there a, I guess when you're going through, when you're first starting out in residency, are you trying to just kind of make yourself pick up those, those complaints that you're not so comfortable with? Obviously, I mean, that makes sense, right? Because you're, you have to learn, you have to, to gain that experience. Yeah. So you need to pick up everything that you can right. early on. I mean, you always need, you know, but, um, everything that you think, and like you said, it's one word, it's, it's not what you think, you know, so that abdominal pain yeah. that you think is appendicitis ends up being an abscess on the psoas. You're like, wow, I would have never thought of that, you know? So, um, the more of something that you see, not only the more comfortable, of course, but the the more broad your differential gets in the future for the things that you can't miss. So you gotta, you gotta push yourself and I'm sure we'll get into it. There's one complaint that everyone shies away from that is just a, you gotta yeah. fall on the sword. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get there. Wait, but before we move on from back pain, so I would think as a patient, are there, well, are there certain things that present as back pain versus abdominal pain? Because in my mind, it's all just in there in the torso. Well, that's yeah. a good point. And like, I don't know where it is. It's just it on the inside. Anything, right? It hurts. Yeah. So actually that, that, that brings up a really good differentiating point. Like if you were telling me that it was abdominal pain so deep that you weren't sure if it was back pain or abdominal pain, that's actually much yeah. more concerning to me than discrete back pain or discrete abdominal pain. And usually people will tell you like my stomach hurts or my back hurts. But when it's mm. both, that's when you really worry about the aorta and the retroperitoneal organs. Um, it's hard to put all that information on the status board, though. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's that's what we get paid the uh, the the big bucks the big for, bucks, as they yeah. say. Right. So. All right, here we go. Eye pain versus ear pain. Mm. Ear problem versus eye problem. Yeah, I hate think, to get think, you with it, but we got to go ear wisely. problem. Ear, you're choosing ear. <laughs> I got to do it to you. It's just it's Nobody so much easier. I, eye eyes. problem. It, it just it's a. Uh, we do have a whole specialty dedicated right, to it, so right. it is a bit more complicated than the ear. No offense to any uh, otolaryngologists yeah. out there. And, and you know what? Like uh, satisfaction wise, people are always disappointed that I'm not an ophthalmologist. Like even though they've come here knowing that they're going to see an ER doctor, <laughs> like what do you mean you can't do surgery today? I'm like I don't even know how to do that. You know, <laughs> be lucky I can stain your eye. <laughs> so there you go. You guys are good with the floor scene. I'll tell oh, you that. Yeah. Love a good floor scene stain. Altered mental status versus headache. Altered mental status. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was quick. That was, he had some yeah, certainty yeah. on that. Yeah. Because yeah, I think altered mental status, and again, this is a very age, God, it's, it's strange. I guess I, I have been in residency for a little because I really like instantly, I'm like, what is the age? That's what I would decide. Like, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, altered mental status in an older person is a very clear cut. Again, work up. It's, you're not probably not going to find the answer. Or if you do, it's antibiotics and admission. So it's, it's usually pretty straightforward. The, the caveat to that is like a young person with altered mental status is very difficult and a very complex workup where you're getting into an LP and potentially, you know, doing an MRI, definitely CT. Um, What's lots the of age cutoff that you think that kind of starts changing your perception of, okay, younger versus older? Not to, I don't want you to, you know, not to yeah. piss off any, any age groups out there, but like, is it over 60 you're starting to, you know? Yeah, I gen- my, my number for most things is like 60 to 65, and that's not to call them old. It's just like, that's where my threshold starts to be like, right. the nerves aren't as good. They're not as good at localizing things. And the differential starts to change a little right. bit. And, right. And it depends yeah. on, and, you know, I hate to put a number on it because it's everyone's health. I've seen 80 right. year olds that I think are 55, and I've seen people that are 40 that look like they're 90. So it, it really depends. But I, I would right. say in that bracket is where I start to think of those, you know, sepsis E type re- reasons. Right. All right. Let's see. I've got a whole bunch of them listed here. I'm trying to decide what to go with. Um, all right. How about hand laceration versus scalp laceration? Scalp. Hmm. Okay. Good staple a scalp all day. Yeah, I figured like the hair maybe it gets in the I don't know, but maybe you're not just not worried about. Don't you just, just shave it off if you're? No, no, no I, I no, leave it. Oh, yeah. but the laceration is there. You're not making the laceration, no. right? Oh, We're not God. doing surgery. Yeah, yeah. Not to, right, no. right, no. <laughs> yeah, so just... so hands, you got to remember, you got all the tendons and nerves and potential yeah. foreign oh, bodies, yeah. and it's true. So it can be. Um, and, and as well as a lot of flexion points, so a lot of difficulty with like keeping those wounds closed um, versus, you know, the scalp is easy to numb up, easy to staple, and hopefully it's somewhere that's not cosmetically going to affect the patient, you know, under their hair. So you can kind of just 
they're happy, you're happy, and they get out with, quickly. With hand lacerations, do you call ortho or plastics or is Not there like usually. a hand, hand specialist? Does that exist? I assume Absol- it does. Absolutely. Oh, hands, hands a big thing. And there's a ton right. of obviously liability in, in hand repair. So yeah. um, anything that hands. involves... What's that? Yeah. They're important. They're important to patients. Yeah. I feel yeah. like your other, hands. Other, other, other than like the scalp. No, who cares? Yeah. Like, right? what are you gonna do? It's hard <laughs> to mess up. Yeah. Anything that that touches a tendon, uh, hand surgery is gonna be involved. All right. Here we go. Here's a big one. Vaginal bleeding versus rectal bleeding. Probably. What makes you more nervous? More more nervous. I it depends on the depends on their vitals really because both of those oh. can bleed like crazy. Um, I think really probably like heavy vaginal bleeding probably makes me more nervous um, because it, it's mm. just, in my opinion, harder to control. Um, you don't I don't see a ton of like profuse rectal bleeding. Like it's if you talk oh, about really? upper GI bleeding, that's that's scary stuff for sure. But lower oh, GI gotcha. usually is a bit slower. Um, it's not oh, to say okay. you, know, you can't have exceptions to the rule, but but vaginal bleeding, like um, you know, postpartum hemorrhage, and like any of these things, can be like life threatening bleeding within the. I mean, I've I've seen someone almost arrest from vaginal bleeding, so um, it, wow. it's scary. That's that's crazy. You know, and, we've talked a lot more about rectums than I had predicted for today. That's true. <laughs> we're we're, we're getting we're getting into the yeah. I mean, both of those sound absolutely terrifying to me. Um, yeah. But you know, I haven't asked a patient to take off their pants in years that's probably a good thing um yeah you know if, if that's a request you get in the eye clinic you should maybe see a different eye doctor um all right how about this double vision versus anything anything <laughs> anything <laughs> anything <laughs> else there's so see, much that's, uh, that's actually almost my my uh, choice as well because I also don't like double vision in the emergency department. Right. That's a hard one. That's tough. And then double you get into the, tough. you know, is it a stroke? Is it not? And that's always an uh-huh. argument with, is neurology going to take this? Is this an optho problem? So undifferentiated ground never does well. That's a, that's that's something that we fight over as well. And so we it's don't like expect double, you to figure that out. If you come in out. with double vision, ugh, if you come in with double vision, you're essentially like a hot potato where the specialists well, are passing you off yeah, to each other kinda, behind kinda, the scenes. It's, you know, I think from an emergency physician standpoint, you can just call both and just let us figure it out ourselves. Yeah. Um, that's probably a good... <laughs> Good I think it's yeah. I think it. it's from from both sides too. It's a, it's from an area of good heart. You know, they want to like yeah. an ophthalmologist doesn't really manage a stroke, so they don't want to miss that. And a neurologist is like, I don't deal with the eyeball, so I don't want to miss that. So right. I think it's a team approach. It is. It absolutely is a team approach. And um, the the difficult thing with with double vision or kind of neuro ophthalmology type issues is is there is a lot that we can do in the eye clinic that we can't do that's actually just more difficult to do diagnostic wise work up um figuring out exactly where the problem might be uh but you know usually getting an mri is, is right there on the on the workup for a lot of double vision actually I, i'll tell you the the one thing that i i teach whenever i talk to emergency physician groups is is uh, the difference between monocular and binocular diplopia? That's that's like the number. So for all, everybody listening who's wondering how You're on still earth awake. do you work, if, yeah, if, if you really are interested in this stuff, um, uh, monocular. So basically, if a patient, you get time for me to take a restroom break. Yeah, please or, okay. go, feel free. Go ahead. Uh, if you cover an eye and the double vision goes away, that is binocular diplopia. They have to have both eyes open in order to have the double vision. If they cover an eye and they're like, oh yeah, I still see two or three or four images. That's dry eye. That's like, you know, go see your ophthalmologist, you know, eye doctor, you know. Why does dry eye day. make double vision? I see the cornea is, uh, I mean, you're looking through it all the time. And if there's dry spots on it, it can diffract light and mm-hmm. cause you to see. It's, it's not so much double vision. It's like a ghosting of images. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's you're not seeing like, um, it's not like I would see two of you if I had dry eye induced double vision. Mm-hmm. I'd see kind of like a shadow of you. Okay. And uh, and so yeah, you know, patients blink. I, I yeah. could I could go all no, day. Yeah, let's let's, really let's not do this. And, and you love visine's a great thing for that, right? Oh really yeah, get, that's really what, get you going there. That's yeah. what I've heard. That's um, you know, <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. ever if you ever need someone in the emergency department to to talk to a patient about, I'm, I'd be more than happy to be on call for you. So please, if they're like, should I, you know, what's the problem with Visine? I'm happy to take that. I love it. Uh, that's a consult I wouldn't mind. He makes having. a lot of friends. I see that. I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm very passionate about a handful of things and uh, Visine. You know, again, 
I don't have a lot of use in the emergency department. Um, and so if, if whatever I can do to help out, I, I'm more than happy. I love it. All right. That's uh, what did I miss? I feel like I got most of like the big things that you guys see. The only um, one that's like a uh, run the other way for most people is a uh, dizziness. It's just oh, dizziness a nightmare tough, of a right? chief complaint because is it central? Is it peripheral? Is it yeah. orthostatic hypotension? I mean, like the list goes on and on and on. And like really yeah, the yeah. only answer, and this is like the, the dissatisfying part is you have to get an MRI, which takes a tremendous amount of time. So it may not be available where you are, um, but you know, a CT scan is not going to tell you the I, cause of it. I always feel bad like asking, sending, you know, cause I'll get a patient that has um, like a central retinal artery occlusion or something, it's, which is a stroke. And it's like, yeah. okay, I need you to go to the emergency. I feel bad asking you guys for an MRI cause I feel like it's impossible. It's, it just depends, it's, just depends on yeah. the site and what the, what the study is. I mean, we definitely yeah. can do it. If there's an MRI machine, it can be done as long as the text there, but you know, budget is different everywhere. And so some of the places we work, we don't have an MRI tech overnight. So we have to, you know, make that call. Is this an emergency to call in the tech or can they do it in the morning? Um, but, and then some places don't have an MRI and you, you, you know, it still right. exists and you have to transfer them. To see techs go Mike. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that's it. That's, that was great. Uh, so let's, let's uh, take a quick break and then we'll come back with a few, a couple of uh, listener stories and we'll finish up here. <laughs> Okay, back with Dr. Adam Goodkoff. And so, Adam, what we do here is we have a couple of fans that uh, uh, fan stories that we like to tell and uh, and uh, get our reactions to them. So here we go. The first one is from Chris. I've got an odd story about something that happened with one of my eyes when I was young. Yeah, that's all it takes. You, you, you talk about eyes like you're going to get on the show here. That's it. I was out riding my bike and rode right into a swarm of gnats, or as I would call it, a bug fight because it looks like they're all fighting. I soon realized one of my eyes was very blurry and it felt like I had something in my eye. I blinked and rubbed and blinked and rubbed to no avail. My mom, thinking that I most likely got a dust or something in my eye, said, sleep on it. All right. And if it's still like this in the morning, we'll go to the walk-in clinic. Of course, I'm sure you can guess where this is going. I still had the issue in the morning. We get to the walk-in clinic. I'm seen. And sure enough, I had a gnat in my eye. They managed to get it out of the clinic, thankfully. It wasn't all bad. I did get to get I did get the day off of school for emotional damage. <laughs> so I can really I can empathize uh-huh. with that. I would have emotional damage if I had an insect in my eye also. It makes me wonder if Chris is from the Midwest because they have those gnats there that do that, right? They just like cluster and then they just like dive bomb your face. Like yeah, they're they trying do. to get into all your orifices. I don't know if you get um, people that come into the emergency department with like thinking they have some kind of parasite or bug or something, because those are probably the most anxious patients that I will get. It happens probably maybe you know, once every other month yeah. where someone's convinced they have a parasite in their eye or yeah, they saw can... something, they've got some kind of insect. We, we get that and we get it in the ears also. Um, but you know, the eye is nice cause you can, you know what we get actually more is, is contact lens. Um, They'd be like, I can't remember if I put a contact in or not. I don't know if it's still in my eye, but it feels like it's there. And so, you know, we'll stain the eye and look around and, um, you know, try and look as as far up and down as we can. They can, they can, they can hide from you. You Oh, yeah. uh, Fragments of contacts. Yeah, Um, that's happened to me I get get people come in and they're like, I lost a contact and sometimes we find them and sometimes we don't. Yeah. Yeah. But they they never disappear. You know, the tricky thing about it as the person with the contact is that if it, were to have just fallen out yeah because sometimes that could happen right Mm -hmm. and you think it's back there because you didn't see it but the problem is now you don't have your contacts in oh you see so it's hard to find then you put another one in (laughs) well and then then you you know like like two contacts um, they're they're irritating their eye repeatedly so they're giving whether it's an actual corneal abrasion or just irritation they feel something in there so makes it worse okay our next story comes from arthur uh, full disclosure, this story is actually from my great aunt's memoirs. She went to medical school in the 1930s in Ireland and later became a general practitioner. This story is from when she was still a student. She had the task of dating a pregnancy and a woman who had come into the clinic as part of an assessment. After an, ex- after an examination, she estimated that the patient was five months pregnant. The patient was furious. She loudly proclaimed that she had only been married for three months. Oopsie. My aunt, who must have been quite naive at the time, backtracked and said she was three months pregnant instead. Her lecturer had to fail her (laughs) 
but apparently found the whole thing quite funny and asked that she and asked if she had ever heard of sex before marriage. Again, this was Ireland in the 1930s. <laughs> I imagine that's that's a difficult topic. Yeah. She repeated the assessment and must have passed because she did go on to qualify as a doctor. No mean feat for a woman in Ireland at that time. Yeah, that's a wow. tough situation to be that's, in. <laughs> that's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but good on her. I mean, that's that's impressive. Like, you know, I, I can't imagine how many you know female physicians there were you know in I Ireland know. 1930s. Especially at that sure time, yeah. Those you got to publish, Arthur. You should publish those memoirs because <laughs> those are the types of stories people would love to hear. So thank you, uh, both of you, Chris and Arthur, for those stories. Send us your stories, knock, knock, hi at human-content.com. Dr. Adam Goodkoff, thank you so much for being here, Adam. It was a pleasure to get to talk to you finally after seeing all your content on social media. Tell us uh, you know, where people f- can find you, what you got working in the works. I don't know. Let's see if I can talk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, t- tell us what's coming up for you. We, yeah, at See The Med Life on uh, Instagram and, and TikTok and uh, The Med Life on YouTube. And we have some fun stuff. Uh, we do interactive cases. So if you like to test your knowledge or kind of play the doctor, they're uh, posted on my Instagram every week. So, you know, whatever the audience chooses is actually what happens. So I spend a long time filming both outcomes. So, you know, some weeks the patient doesn't make it and some weeks they get it right. Um, so it's a fun way. And then That's the content cool. that we make actually supports those cases so that you can go and learn what you needed to know to get that case right. So oh, uh, we have that cooking idea. there. And uh, yeah, and then uh, we're, we're soon to be relaunching the YouTube a little bit with some a new kind of forward looking health tech, med tech focus. And we're very excited about that, too. Awesome. All right. Very check it cool. out. Well, thanks again for being here. Best Thank you both. You. Appreciate you having me. Thanks. Well, that was a fun conversation. It's about time we got somebody in training on here. Yes. Just a different perspective on things. And, you know, that's right. And that's when all the good stories are happening. I mean, if you listen back to previous a guests, lot a lot there. of them are from residency yeah. stories. Could do that's a we could just make the entire podcast, you know, interviews with residents probably. and probably have a lot of fun. <laughs> residents um, and nurses, I think. And thank you all for yeah, and thank you all for sharing your stories. And uh, if you have like stories from training, if you're in medicine and in any kind of role, and you have those are a lot of times the the most embarrassing, the best learning experiences, or uh, whenever you're training to be a doctor or a nurse or, or whatever it is. Um, and so share them with us, you know, share us your thoughts about, uh, the episode today. And, um, if you have any uh, ideas for games I could play with our guests, like that's, I've, I'm always open to ideas as well. Lots of ways to hit us up. Email us, knock, knock, hi at human dash content.com. Visit our social media. Uh, we're on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, I think that's all everything, but like Facebook, we don't have a Facebook. We're working on, we got to work on that. Do our we gotta, do- because my stuff shows up on Facebook all yeah, the time. Yeah, true. We got, we got to get on there. Um, and uh, hang out with us and the Human Content Podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at Human Content Pods. Thanks to all the great listeners leaving wonderful. They're all great. All of you are great. There's no, none of you that are not great. You're all great. And you're all leaving wonderful feedback for us. That's, that's awesome. We love the reviews. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. So we have uh, Dakeeb on Apple said, Dr. G and his wife make medical talk fun to listen to, even for me, a non-medical person. <laughs> Just a really engaging set of personalities. Love seeing Dr. Mike on an episode two. Uh, it's, it's, that's, that's high praise for, uh, if we can get non-medical people like interested mm-hmm. in some medical stuff, uh, like, you know, how to reduce a prolapsed, pro, prolapsed rectum. Yeah. I feel like we've succeeded. We all uh, learned something yeah. today. <laughs> Uh, full episodes of uh, this podcast are up on um, on my YouTube channel at D Glock and Flecken. We also have a Patreon. Lots of cool perks, bonus episodes, where we react to medical shows and movies. Hang out with other members of this community, of the Knock Knock High community. We're there uh, interacting, posting things, videos, my random thoughts at like 10 o'clock at night sometimes. Uh, early ad-free episode access. Q&A live stream events, which we did recently. A lot more coming too. Patreon.com slash Glockenflecken or go to Glockenflecken.com for more info. Speaking of Patreon community perks, new member shout out Victoria B and Chaver W. 
Shout out to all the Jonathans out there. Uh, we have Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Abby H, Stephen G, Rosk Box, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Dr. J, and Chaver W. I am actually going to say also, Mr. Granddaddy, I know I keep saying that. Uh, that is my dad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, hi, dad. Uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, supporting this podcast. <laughs> uh, and then Patreon Roulette. Uh, this is uh, a, someone who's on the, uh, the, uh, the, no, emergency. the emergency medicine mm-hmm. tier of Patreon. We're going to give a random shout out. So I will do the drum roll. roll. <gasps> shout out to Derek N for being a patron. How's it going, Derek? Thank you all for listening. We are your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, a.k.a. The Glockenflecken. Special thanks to our guest today, Dr. Adam Goodkoff. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corny, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brick. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omar Benzvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs, program disclaimer, ethics, policy, submission, verification, and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockandflagon.com or reach out to us at human da- uh, knock knock high at human-content.com with any questions concerns or jokes or puns if you have to knock <laughs> knock high is a human content production Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.